This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Greg Kokel. He's done over 33 years of uh, interactive talk radio. He's spoken at um, 80 or more mm-hmm. uh, colleges and universities here and abroad, written some books, tactics, and uh, what was it called? The Real- Story of Reality. Story of Reality. Relativism. I got a new one coming out next summer called Street Smarts. Uh, oh, great. So there you go. That's awesome. And actually, I've read Tactics in high school and absolutely loved it. It was one uh-huh. of a few books I read of my own accord in high school. So, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm so impressed. whatever that's worth. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> um, so super excited to have Greg here. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to talk about how do you talk with someone you disagree with? Yeah. So open-ended question, how would you answer Well, that? Um, the tactics book that you mentioned, and now it's there's a 10th anniversary edition probably since you were in high school, yeah. I suspect, which radically expanded the material that I had in there. But um, that describes a way of engaging people that um, at Stand to Reason, the organization I represent, um, we consider to be diplomatic. We, we're trying to build ambassadors for Christ, okay? Mm-hmm. This, is, this is kind of the frame of mind that we have when we go into conversations with people we disagree with. So there's a knowledge element to be a good ambassador. There's mm-hmm. also a character element to being a good ambassador. If, if you just think about, here we are in the D.C. area, you know, you just think about political ambassadors. But there also has to be a a technique, a, a knack for maneuvering in conversations to mm. be an effective ambassador. And this is where the tactical material comes in with the book. Mm. And uh, the core of the tactics, there are a lot of different tactics in the book, and they have names like uh, Just the Facts, Ma'am, and Road Scholar, and Taking the Roof Off, and What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And these are all maneuvers kind of in conversations uh, to help you stay in the driver's seat in a, in a good way, okay? Not in an abusive way mm-hmm. or, or an inappropriately controlling way or anything like that, but to, be, to direct the conversation the way you want, to, uh, want the conversation to go, uh, the way that you think would be best and most effective. But there's the, the, the number one tactic for doing that, and it really represents the game plan that all of the other tactics serve I call the Colombo tactic. Now, I don't know if that name means anything. To you. Well, you read the book, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, most most people under thirty, you know, they're scratching their head. But Colombo refers to a TV character uh-huh. that from from you know fifty years ago almost. But he had a long run, Lieutenant Colombo, and he was a uh, Peter Falk was the the actor there, and and he was a, a murder detective that would come in the crime scene kind of bumbling and uh, inauspicious and scratching his head and mumbling to himself. He's got a cigar. He's got a trench coat, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, This guy doesn't look like he can think his way out of a wet paper bag. Uh-huh. Uh, but he has, a, he has a plan. And before long, he starts asking questions. And, um, and as he, the more questions he asks, the more information he's able to get. And sometimes they seem innocuous at first, but after he's gotten enough information by asking questions, now he's using questions to, to trap the murderer mm. in this case. He's got a pretty good idea who it is, and he's going to try to f- ask questions then to exploit the, the, the criminal in a certain sense. So there's a parallel here in our conversations with other people. Mm-hmm. So if if there's somebody who disagrees with me on something, or we are somehow maybe in into a, um, a a topic that is a controversial moral issue, and Christians ought to care about all of those, mm-hmm. whether it's abortion or racism or the the issue of the poor, whatever, all the the heavy duty things that are mm-hmm. going on, being talked about right now. Um, if we're involved in some kind of topic like that, or talking about some spiritual issue also just as controversial, mm-hmm. um, then then there are some steps to moving forward in a conversation, mm-hmm. okay? Now, Josh, I'm going to make a, a do, do, do an excursus here. Just step aside for a moment, and I, I want to make an observation about what I'm after in these conversations. Mm-hmm. And I talk about this in the book, and, and you, you might recall it. I don't know how long ago high school was for you, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was about the 10th year and uh, anniversary is a good time, oh, okay. time frame. Yeah, eight years, six okay. years. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so so um, my approach and our approach is stand to reason, I mentioned, w- is to be an ambassador. So we're not thinking of ourselves as evangelists, mm. all right? 
uh, we are thinking not so much of trying to get people to sign on the dotted line, mm. because that actually that kind of thing didn't happen very much in the book of Acts. Mm. That is, somebody shares Christ and says, will you like to receive Christ? Or the group gets together and there's a preacher and say, well, you want to come forward, mm-hmm. altar calls and all of that other stuff. There was something, that, that's certainly ro- reaping, but Jesus said in John 4, there's got to be sowing before there can be reaping. Mm. You're about to reap where you did not sow, he tells mm. the disciples there. Uh, in other words, there's one field for us, but there are two seasons in the field or in an individual's life. Mm. That's a sowing season and a reaping season, what I call gardening mm. and harvesting. Yeah. And therefore, two kinds of workers, sowers, gardeners, reapers, harvesters. Mm. Now, some people are really obvious harvesters. They go out, they talk to lots of people, and a lot of people come forward. Okay, mm. They're really good at that, but we think of that as the only model, the, mm. the right model, the Christian model. You know, And so if we're not harvesting and getting people to pray to receive Christ, we're kind of spiritual losers, mm. right? Yeah. But there couldn't be a harvest unless there were gardeners. Okay. Yeah. Let me just say that again because I want, I want our listeners to get this, our viewers. There can't be a harvest unless there's been gardening. Mm. When you think about it, no duh, it's like, that's true in agrarian things, it's also true in spiritual things. Hardly anybody comes to Christ the minute they first hear the gospel. It's a process, okay? Now it's true in my life uh, 49 years ago, and it's true in just about everybody else's life who becomes a believer, particularly later in life, as opposed to being raised in a Christian family. And so what I'm after is I'm not not shooting uh, I, I'm not. I'm not shooting for. I'm not swinging for the fences. Let me mm. put it that way. I'm not trying to get somebody to sign on the. This is not the goal of my conversations. Mm-hmm. Okay, my goal is to garden. Yeah. Okay, and the tactical game plan is a gardening tool. Mm. So I figure if I can garden a little bit, then maybe with that person, maybe you'll garden with them next, or somebody else down the road, or in another state, or wherever. Yeah. As God is overseeing the process. All that gardening gets done until the person is ready to become a Christian. And by the way, when they're ready, the fruit that's ripe falls into the basket real easily. Mm. I have a lot of stories I could tell you about about that, but just conceptually. Happened to me, September 28th, 1973. I just had my spiritual birthday a few weeks ago. Mm. Um, My brother had been sharing Christ with me a lot. He came to my apartment that Friday night, started talking about Jesus. I told him, I don't want to hear about Jesus anymore. I've already decided I want to become a Christian. Mm. So, you know, it took me about 15 minutes to peel them off the ceiling, right? Yeah. But notice that when the fruit was ripe, it dropped into the basket. Yeah. So <clears throat> all that to say, when I'm engaged with somebody who's, who I'm talking with about uh, moral issues that are controversial mm. or uh, spiritual issues that are also controversial, what I'm trying to do first off, <clears throat> I'm not thinking about winning them to Christ. I'm not even thinking about the gospel, okay? I'm doing one thing first, and this is the first step of the game plan. Mm. I just want to gather information. Mm. So are you gathering information for yourself, or are you gathering information, or are the questions to kind of guide them to be aware of where they stand? Yeah, that's a really perceptive question, because both are true. Mm. Um, I think a lot of times people think, well, if I'm going to ask questions, I, I need that for myself. Well, that's true. You need some in- intel. You need um, you need uh, uh, a lay of the land, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, so that you don't charge into a circumstance where you're not prepared. I uh, sat down next to a guy in an airplane, and, uh, and this is in the book. This illus- this anecdote, and 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 uh, his name was John, and and he, you know. I started talking to him, and he, as we, he told me, he asked me where I was going, and I told him something like this, and so he knew I was a believer, and he mm-hmm. said, "I'm not a Christian." Okay, that's good information for me to know, right? Mm-hmm. Good. Then he said, "I used to be a Christian." Mm. Oh, that's good information too. Yeah. Then he said, "I used to be a preacher's kid." Mm. Huh? I said, "John, how'd you used to be a preacher, preacher's kid? Did your dad die?" He said, "No, my dad didn't die. I just, uh, my dad's no longer a preacher." That's why I'm no longer a preacher's kid. <laughs> In fact, my dad's no longer a Christian. Mm. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot is, there. Is the, it's right. Yeah. The baggage sitting here next to me. Okay, now mm. can you imagine? That's information. Mm-hmm. I'm not preaching. I'm just listening 
gathering information. He's telling me stuff. Now I'm getting the lay of the land. Can you imagine if I had charged into that and started talking mm-hmm. to him about Jesus, loving him and all that? Yeah. And uh, he's going to say, been there, done that, and it hurt, right? Mm. So all I want to do is get information in general. One type is for me. But there's another type you mentioned, and that is also for um, – actually, you 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 – you said three different things there that mm. I caught when they're all good. First, information for me. Mm-hmm. Second, information so I know what future questions to ask. Okay. Right. So you mentioned that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be drawing a person out, and I'm gonna be paying attention, mm-hmm. so that if there's some ambiguities or l- lack of clarity in anything that they said, I can ask more questions about that. So what I'm trying to do is get a, a fairly full picture of their point of view, mm-hmm. all right? And that enables me to um, maybe, in my own mind, chart a path of where I might go. Secondly, it, it helps me to understand the view accurately so I don't misrepresent it. Mm-hmm. That's called a straw man. It's an informal fallacy. It's also mm-hmm. bad manners, you know? Yeah. You want to understand a person's view. But here's the third thing that you alluded to, and that is I want— them to understand their own view too. Mm. Now that sounds weird, doesn't it? Like, how can a person not know his own view? Mm. Very few people understand their own view. Yeah, non Christians or Christians. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how few people have thought very deeply. And you don't have to be profound and you know an IQ of 150 and you be a philosopher and a theologian to to think a little bit more carefully about the things that really matter. Mm-hmm. And um, most of the things that I deal with as a, as a Christian apologist, defending the truth, capital T, truth of mm-hmm. Christianity, um, comport largely with common sense. Mm. They're tied to the way the world actually is. So um, I, 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 as I'm asking for clarification, of the other person's view, he realizes he can't answer with any very much detail because Mm -hmm. he hasn't thought about it. And so it's not unusual for people to come into a conversation with a lot of bluster and their their sails full of either themselves or their ideas or whatever and saying their stuff like this and that. And he said, oh, that's interesting. Let me ask you, you mind if I ask you a question about that? What... um, Help me understand this. Mm-hmm. Help me st- and what you you can kind of almost visually see the wind go out of their sails. Mm-hmm. They just start to droop. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I actually did a debate, um, a, a national TV debate. Now it was about 12, 12 years or so ago, maybe longer, uh, with Deepak Chopra, who was the number one New Age guru in the world at the okay. time. He had sold twenty million books. He's probably wow. doubled it since then. Yeah. Okay. And um, and he he doesn't get opposed by other people very very frequently. In other words, nobody takes exception with him. He can say what he wants. But mm-hmm. this was an interactive thing, mm-hmm. and so uh, we were both in sound stages. He was in New York. I was in Los Angeles. And um, and in the process of the conversation, you could just see the wind go out of his sails. Mm. And pretty soon he's sitting there. I mean, kind of, if you watch it, you can see it. He's sitting there kind of like this. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and he was so discouraged. And I wasn't impolite to him or anything. Mm-hmm. I always called him Dr. Chopra, you know, but it just didn't go well for him because now he had to make sense of his own view. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. And, and, and for example, he was faulting me for saying that my view is the right way. Mm. But of course, Nobody sells 20 million books saying, I have some suggestions, but everybody's way is just as good as anybody else's way. Mm. Yeah. You know, so, and nobody ever, ever had ever pressed that issue with him before. So I just use that as an example yeah. of the wind kind of going out of people's sails and inability of people to really, in many cases, to make sense of their own view, much less defend mm. it. Yeah. And I think obviously that takes a lot of honing that skill to kind of get to the through the gymnastics of you made this claim here's what it's standing on here's where it's not really actually very structurally sound and how can i ask it 
I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of steps to that, right? Because you, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, see what's being claimed. You have to see where it's not sound. And I think if I get that far, usually then I'm like, look, that's wrong, you know, but, and that doesn't work. So right. like being able to then, you know, with that information, ask a question that invites them to see that. That's is, right. Well, this is, um, there's some truth to what you say that there is a process of learning to get better at it. Mm. But it's really easy to begin. Mm. And what I emphasize most of the times when I teach this, and uh, in, 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 a, in a few weeks I'm spending a, a whole, the whole day on the East Coast here somewhere in North Carolina and just teaching tactics, okay? Mm. And a huge part of what I'm emphasizing there is not all the different maneuvers, but just the basic game plan and particularly the stages and the ways of gathering information. And here's the way I describe it, Josh. I say, you're going to be in the shallow end of the pool most of the conversation. Mm. In other words, you're ankle deep. You're, there's no threat for you at all because you're going to ask people what their view is. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a student of their view. And uh, this doesn't require that you know anything mm -hmm. but some simple questions like, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Or how did you come to that conclusion or something like that? I realized I was frowning a little when I said, what do you mean by that? Because that's sometimes where you feel, huh, yeah. that, you know. Yeah. But you don't want to ask the question that way. You want to be show, be polite and show genuine interest. I'm confused about that, Josh. Tell me what exactly do you have in mind? Yeah. Give me a little more detail. That kind of question. And then let them talk. Mm -hmm. So notice when you're asking questions, you can, you are not in the hot seat. Mm -hmm. You're not even making your point. And if you're not making your point, making claims, then you don't have anything to defend. Mm -hmm. So you have nothing to answer for. Well, don't I ever get to preach the gospel? Well, yes, in time, but not yet. Mm -hmm. And because, because the model that we've received in evangelicalism is a preach the gospel, see if they'll pray kind of thing. It's the reason a whole bunch of people, Christians, are still sitting on the bench. Because mm -hmm. that scares them, mm -hmm. and I get it, especially in this culture, okay? But if they had a, a technique they could use, a, yeah. a means, a plan by which they could have friendly, relaxed conversations, mm -hmm. and, and even if all they're doing, at least in the initial stages, is just gathering different types of information, minimally they're getting an education mm -hmm. about the other person's views. And um, I—, I, I one year at the University of Minnesota, we were teaching a class. We were actually, the class was in a church just across the street from the campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a whole group of people teaching all Saturday morning and early afternoon on the tactical approach. And then we gave them a survey, and they had to go out two by two mm -hmm. in, on the campus. Now, of course, they're thinking, I didn't know I was going to actually have to share my <laughs> faith if, or do something, engage. Yeah, yeah. Um, Got them. Yeah, but, but uh, they were... They, they, that was part of the deal, so they had yeah. to do it. Now, afterwards, one of the women, as she's debriefing, she said, when you guys said I had to go across the street and start talking to college kids about Jesus in some fashion, and, the, of course, the survey was a helpful tool, mm -hmm. but they also had some of the tactical tools that I'd given them they could begin employing, mm -hmm. not hard. Mm -hmm. But she said, when you said that, I was so scared. Mm -hmm that it scared me, this is what she said, it scared me more than having another baby. Wow. I would rather yeah. go through childbirth. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> wow. That was what she said about how she felt before she went out. Mm. She said, however, now that I'm back, I'm thrilled that I did it, really mm. glad, and I noticed two things, and here's what she said. She said, first of all, people are not as scary as I thought they were, mm. which is really true. Mm. Um, Every, if any, for people who travel a lot, you know, you know, everybody who sits down next to you is weird mm -hmm. until you say hi. Yep. The minute you say hi, introduce yourself if you're into that, or you just, you know, say hi. You know, all of a yeah. sudden they're human beings, and mm -hmm. it breaks down the barrier a little bit. And so the same thing here. The minute we start engaging humans as humans, we realize they're not so scary. They're just people. Mm -hmm. They're just humans. And if we have a goal to embrace conversationally, people in that way, mm -hmm. as human beings, it's a lot easier. So that was the first observation. Here's her second observation. First, she said they're not as scary as I thought they'd be. Mm -hmm. 
second observation. They're not as smart as I thought they were either. Mm. Now, she's not saying they're dumb. Yeah, yeah. But she expected to go out and be blown away mm. at the University of uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis campus by all these really smart, thoughtful students, mm. undergrads, grads, PhDs, professors, all this other stuff. And she said, I was amazed, essentially, at how shallow their thinking was on these kinds of issues. Yeah. And this is one reason when you're when even when you listen to the public debate, characteristically you get you get two or three kinds of standard responses. First of all, people call you names. You're Islamophobe, you're homophobe, you're bigot, you're you know, this is the way they intelligently respond on issues. They mm. just call names. Mm. Another one is they'll just say uh, that they do what's called the genetic fallacy. Well, you, you, you're against abortion. Of course you are. You're a man. Mm. You know, So it's like you can't, what do you have to say? Well, whether it's right or wrong to kill unborn children has nothing to do with the, the sex slash gender that the arg of the of the person that the argument's mouth comes out of, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It's, this is irrelevant. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so, but you're going to get moves like that mm -hmm. that make that make no sense at all. Mm -hmm. They're just angry. They're just they're just foolish. Okay. When when I see all of that kind of stuff going on, which I can see very quickly, and uh, when those who kind of are familiar with the tactical approach can see it real quickly too. You don't. You just have to be exposed to it for a few minutes. The insights, and you realize, oh, there it is, all over the place. Mm. You know, uh, that's an evidence that they don't have an argument because mm. they have to resort to silencing you. Mm. That's another one. You know, uh, and uh, oh, you you think you're right? Well, come outside, and I'll show you a thing or two. Step out in the in the alley, and that's that's cancel culture. Right, mm. so they don't have an argument, so they they bully you in different kinds of ways. All right, so the when that happens, you realize, wow, that I I, th I thought they were smarter than that. Mm. And uh, now it isn't that there can't be reasonably intelligent counters that people give, and occasionally you encounter them; and they need to be dealt with. But um, but the rank and file are not like that. Mm -hmm. Just like the rank and file Christian can't defend his convictions, um, the rank and file non Christian can't make any sense out of theirs as well. Mm -hmm. you know, all they do is yell and scream, call names, and cancel. Now, it's a generalization, but you can take any broadcast, any m newspaper article, any, I can, I'll stand, look at it, and I'll say, there it is. Boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. Where is the substantive response? to the issue that is raised by the person from the other side. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things you discover. And it, it when you do that, I think it emboldens the Christian to be willing to have more conversations. Yeah. And even if the Christian is not technically defending their convictions, mm -hmm. spiritual or otherwise, they are still having an impact when they ask the question. If, if we have time, I want to give you a quick illustration of that. Yeah. No, so please. I was in Seattle a couple of year ago, years ago. Uh, let me back up for a second. The, the very first Colombo question, the gathering information questions, what mm. do you mean by that? That's mm. all it is. It's a very, it has a lot of different questions that you could use that are like that. It's variations, but it's basically you're, you're gathering, you're getting more information about what the person had said. Mm. So I'm in Seattle. I worked Friday night and all day Saturday at a conference. There were some other speakers. I didn't do everything, but I was pretty tired on Sunday morning. And I'm not mm -hmm. a morning person, yeah. all right? My standard line is, before my first cup of coffee, I'm an atheist, right? So <laughs> uh, I'm my atheist self, r pulling my roller bag into the coffee shop there, want to get a little coffee, wake up, become a deist or a theist of some sort, and <laughs> eventually, and have some scrambled eggs and get off to the church that I'm supposed to speak at that morning. All right. Oh. The young lady who's the waitress is way too energetic for me for that time in the morning. Uh -huh. Right. So she's all buoyant, and I just want to get. I want her to go away. Oh, the other <laughs> thing I didn't tell you. I do not want to talk about Jesus. I do not want to talk about God. I do not want to talk. Get my coffee. Get my eggs. Go away. That's my attitude. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> So she asked me what I'm doing, right? Well, mm. well, what are you doing in Seattle? I'll, oh, I'll get rid of her. I said, I'm going to go preach in a church in a couple of hours. <laughs> okay, that'll get, her, get rid of her, right? And she says, oh, that's great. 
And I'm thinking, why would she think that's great? Maybe she's a Christian. So I asked her, are you a Christian? Now, notice what was my first response to her comment to me. Reflexive. I mean, uh, impul- what's the right word? It was automatic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I-, I was asking a clarification question. What do you mean by that, Yeah. essentially? Yeah. Are you a Christian? Oh, no, I'm not a Christian. Oh. I used to be a Christian, but I'm not anymore. Then she says, now the universe takes care. <laughs> Sorry for chuckling. The universe takes care of me, is what mm-hmm. she said. And I'm thinking, huh? Mm-hmm. And so I said, what do you mean the universe takes care of you? It was polite, but I was curious. Yeah. Notice it's the same kind of question. Now, do I want to witness to her? Mm-hmm. Do I want to witness to her? Yeah. No, I don't want to witness to her. Oh, wait, her. sorry. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I was going I don't long want to game, talk. Yeah, right. sorry. <laughs> I, I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to witness. I don't yeah, want to yeah. tell her. I want her to go away. Yeah, yeah. But I can't help myself because she says this thing that's so odd. The universe takes care of you. I said, how could the universe take care of you? Is the universe a person? Just curious. She mm. says, no. I said, well, how could it take care of you? And she pauses for a minute and thinks about that. Mm. She had never thought about that. Yeah. And she said, well, I guess God takes care of me. Oh, okay, well, that makes more sense. Fine. And then she says, God is the universe. Mm. And I'm thinking, huh? So I ask her, how could God be the universe? So we, there was a couple more exchanges like that. And honest to goodness, Josh, I had not the slightest feeling that I was making any kind of dent in her at all. And by, by the way, all I'm trying to do is make sense out of the comments she's making to kind of be polite in the conversation. Mm-hmm. But they're all the Colombo number one questions. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that in some very Finally, she leaves. I get my breakfast. And I'm about to go. And she brings the bill. And here's what she says to me. She says, nobody has ever asked me questions about my view before. Mm. And she says, it got me thinking. Mm. <laughs> I had a chuckle at that because I wasn't trying to do anything spiritual. Mm. Uh, I wasn't even trying, and the Holy Spirit was using the questions I was asking in a good-natured way, showing an interest in her and a curiosity of nothing else. And uh, and and I was actually able to leave a book with her that I'd written, but I called the story of reality because that has the basics of Christianity in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was very happy to receive it, and you know, I never saw her again after that. But God knows. Mm-hmm. But I was just doing what I could do. I call it putting a stone in their shoe. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just trying to get them thinking, you know, yeah. maybe annoy them in a good way a yeah. little bit. And so uh, that's the uh, that, that's the essence of the, you know, that part of the game plan. What I wanted to emphasize in light of the, the way you asked your question at first is that it it's not complicated to get going. Mm-hmm. And you can stay in the shallow end of the pool as long as you want. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go out there, in, you know, preaching just keep asking questions. Mm. It's tr- There's tremendous safety in asking questions because if you're asking, you're not proclaiming. And if you're not proclaiming, then you don't have anything to, to defend. Mm. But I, the reason I gave the illustration is because when you're asking in the right way, the, the, the inf- it causes people to think. Mm. And it's something the Holy Spirit can use. So this is especially good for beginners for people, no theology hardly, <laughs> no philosophy, mm. no apologetics, no fancy footwork, nothing. That's okay. Just start asking questions. Yeah. That's all. That's all you have to do. And just pay attention. Mm. Pay attention. Then ask more questions. Yeah. And the way the way you describe it makes me think of a quote that I think is Picasso, but actually I got it from a TV show, so I'm not sure. But um, it says be he says be curious, not judgmental. Um, not that there's never a point at which you are discerning and, you know, like, right. Right, this is where you are, but just right. this idea of, for example, with, uh, with the gentleman on the plane initially where you're like, where he says, I used to be a Christian and I'm not, right. you can make a judgment on that. But if you continue to be curious, sure. you can make a more astute judgment. If you continue to unearth more uh-huh. that's happening, then your, your judgment is more accurate and it just opens up. Yeah, you're more. right. And so your posture, this, I think, expresses the posture well. Now, I think that Picasso, if that's where they came from, or someone like whoever it came from, was actually making a broader world viewpoint, too, mm, you know. Yeah. But practically speaking, yeah, we want to kind of come in neutral because we, we want to find some common ground and we want to have a conversation, mm-hmm. all right? That doesn't mean that we, we don't express points that are uh, uh, that that 
w- would would be considered judgmental by other people because mm-hmm. the gospel is a judgment. It entails a judgment, okay? Yeah. But just for the, for the fun of it, if somebody said to me, um, like using your citation there, said, oh, I think it's good to ask questions as long as you're not judging. Mm. So well, what would happen if I started judging? Okay, notice that's a question. Mm-hmm. It's a question to get a little bit more information, but I'm setting a trap up here because I know something that just happened that they don't realize what they did. Yeah. So he says, ask questions as long as you don't judge. Okay, what happens if I start judging? Well, then you shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be doing that? Why not? Because that's judging. Is judging wrong? Yeah, judging's wrong. If judging is wrong, then why are you judging me right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I saw so deer in the headlights. Yeah. All questions right there, but I noticed immediately that the statement entailed judgment mm. of judgers. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's, it's helpful to see you break that down because I, I noticed several points in that process where I was like, and that would be where I come in and make a statement. But then you ask one more question. That's that was, right. Oh, okay. Now I'm thinking about that and I'm I'm coming to this conclusion of not being handed a that's you know, right. A package. The, Here the, you go. The standard way of doing that would have been said, well wait a minute. That's judgmental what you're doing. So that's an accusation. Mm, now yeah. would would it be accurate? Yes. Would it been uh, in a certain sense, appropriate to challenge the person for doing the very thing he's saying that that the Christian or whatever shouldn't be doing? Mm-hmm. Yes, but it's not artful. It's mm-hmm. not shrewd. Yeah. Okay, using the questions, though, mm-hmm. um, changes the nature of it entirely. The point is it's not only just as effective, it's more effective. But notice that every time I played very quickly, I played both sides there. Mm-hmm. But every time I ask the question— the ball goes into the other person's court. It's mm-hmm. on them. Comes back to me. What's wrong with w- w- what would happen if I judge? Well, they shouldn't be judging. Mm. Why shouldn't they be judging? Mm. Well, because that's wrong. Well, isn't that a judgment? Mm. Why are you judging judges? Mm-hmm. Boom! It's back in the court. It. What are they going to say? They're. 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 I mean, I had a guy that I had this conversation with, and and he kept trying to find. He, he couldn't figure out how, how to get out of that. And finally he says, well, I guess it's okay to judge, which is progress there. But then he says, as long as you don't force your morality on other people, as long as you don't push your morality is the way he put it. Uh-huh. And I said, well, Gil, um, is that your morality? Question mm-hmm. for clarification. Yes, that's my moral view that it's wrong to push other your mm-hmm. morality. In. So you're chuckling now because you see the problem yeah, right yeah. away. He didn't see it. Yeah. He didn't see it. He thought it improved his situation. So I said, well, if that's your morality, that you should push your morality on other people, why are you pushing it on me on me right now? Mm. And <laughs> he was like, he had no idea what mm. to do. And I have had people that said, well, now you got me all confused. <laughs> I said, well, no, you were, you were confused when you started. Uh, you know? <laughs> but I always make it friendly, all right? Yeah. Um, but... Now I'm, I'm thinking about your listeners, viewers, who may have been caught themselves in this thing about mm-hmm. the judgment, that next time this kind of thing comes up, I bet you they're going to see it. Mm-hmm. And if they, oh, I never saw that before. And so then if you see it again, ask some questions about it, just mm-hmm. the way I've kind of role modeled in the situation. But this kind of stuff happens all the time. Yeah. And uh, it's remarkably easy to, to show that. Now, with regards to judgment, there are times when judging is inappropriate. Certain types of judgment are not appropriate. Mm-hmm. But there are other types of judgment that are commanded in the New Testament, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, so so this is where we have to be. Jesus said, judge with righteous judgment, not with condescending, hypocritical judgment. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, but I think, and back to the question idea, I think for someone who genuinely has kind of made this knot that doesn't actually create anything, you know, this this loop that doesn't actually make sense, First, for that to be unwound with a question is just much more gracious, yeah. obviously, than, look, you're an idiot. You know, it's like, oh, okay, right. I, right. I guess I am, but now I don't really like you or what yeah, you stand for. Right. But if yes, it's, yeah, you know. that's right. And, and I do agree that on some issues, th- there, there's, there's more complexity to them. Mm-hmm. I just finished uh, like two days ago. Actually, yesterday I sent the last chapter into Zondervan, a book that's coming out in the summer. I might have mentioned it a moment ago, mm. and that was it's called Street Smarts, and it's using questions 
to answer Christianity's toughest challenges, mm. okay? So that's the subtitle, but the main title is Street Smarts. So the street is where you feel uncomfortable, you know, you go out and you say, oh, I'm vulnerable. But of course, you're if you're, if you're a, a police officer and you're, have a weapon, you got a baton, and you got backup and all, you don't feel so bad because mm. you can handle yourself, I guess is the best way to put it. Mm. So when we go out in the street, as it were, as followers of Christ in our community and stuff, and there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on and being talked about, you know, we're vulnerable mm. because we're, we're, we're not prepared. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is meant to prepare you. So, but when it comes to some issues, they're more com- complicated. So, like, let's just say gender, sex, marriage, all right? Uh, that's really volatile right now. Mm-hmm. So, and a lot of Christians are just simply confused about it. And so a, a lot of what I do in the book is I, I spend time talking about the issues and, hear, and, and giving the truth regarding these things. And I give the biblical statements, biblical rationale, but uh, when it comes to gender, sex, and marriage, look, you don't need a Bible to figure out what's true, Mm. because civilizations have been figuring it out for thousands of years with no holy writ. Mm. And, uh, but once you get confident, the Christian gets confident of this, okay, now what? Mm. Okay, now what's the next step? Well, the next step is gonna be to ask questions, of course, but you want to use questions that reflect your understanding of the problems. Okay. okay, and so this is a lot of what I've worked on in the text and worked out dialogues that Christians can ask. Now we know what the truth is about these things. Now how do we, how do we em- employ those in conversations where people are raising some of these issues? You know, mm. So somebody says, does God hate gays? So my question is, why would you think God hates gays? Well, you Christians think that homosexuality is 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 wrong. Well, strictly speaking, it's the actions that are wrong, but mm. um, do you think that Christians think that fornication is wrong? Yeah, of course you do. Well, do you think God hates fornicators too? Like heterosexuals as mm. well as... Oh, I don't know. No, God doesn't hate any of these people. Mm-hmm. He hates sin. Mm-hmm. So there's a... Notice that there's a... I have a little plan that mm-hmm. I can m- move through the conversation. Now, after that, I don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. But at least I've got a plan that help can help clear up some confusion and maybe move forward in a productive way in a conversation with somebody who raises a volatile um, cultural issue right now, like yeah. homosexuality. Yeah, especially in if you, the distinction between that and just a general bringing up something with a stranger versus topics that are like this is kind of loaded and ready to go and how do we kind of engage that with a question versus if i see someone and kind of you know at coffee and engage with them about their life thanks for tuning in to hear more go to digdeeperdc.com